Good evening, everybody, and praise the Lord. We are delighted to welcome you once again to this Thursday evening meeting. We are glad that you are able to join us from wherever you are. We want to thank God for this opportunity, and we pray that he's going to walk with us and minister to us this day. So we want to start with a word of prayer, and then we shall go on. We pray that God is going to bless us wherever we are and wherever you are. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you, we bless you, we worship your holy name this evening. We are grateful for the gift of life. We are grateful that you have kept us, watched over every one of us, and granted us this day and this opportunity to be able to come uh, into your presence and to even speak and share one with another. We pray that you are going to minister to us, speak to us, give us a mighty entrance into your word, give us revelation into your word even as we speak. May you continue to speak to us, may you continue to guide us, may you continue to lead us into the depths of your word as we minister and as we go on. Let deep call unto deep, dear Lord, even as we continue in this service and as we share. We bless you and we honor you. Minister to us beginning to the end to the glory of your name. In Jesus' holy name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Sharon.
because everything is possible in God. Where you are, where you are, where you are present, where you are present, where your presence is, oh God, everything is possible in God. And we trust you, Lord. We put our faith and our trust in you, oh God. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you because you're encouraging us, oh God, to let, oh God, to look up to you, oh God. Thank you, blessed be your holy name. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord this evening for this opportunity of ministration. Reminding us that wherever he is, everything is is possible. Wherever we invite him, wherever his presence is, everything is possible. Amen. 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 And we continue to celebrate him in joy and in gladness. Hallelujah. God, we want to go straight to the Word of God. We don't have a lot of time, so we are going to take the short time that we have to bring the Word of God to us. Uh, like we always say, we are coming to you from the Soul Winning Revival Church, Banana Hill, and we thank God for enabling us to be able to minister to you this way. For now, for this season, for his own reason, we will continue to celebrate him, we will continue to serve him, we will continue to minister even as he enables us. So this evening I want us to go to the Word of God and I want us to read the book of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 11, and we'll read verse 1 to 4. Luke chapter 11, verse 1 to, go, uh, to 4. And I want us to look at uh, our lives of prayer or prayer as communion with God. Prayer as a way of communing with God. So we go to look at Luke chapter 11 verse 1 to 4 and it says, I'll read from my version. One day in a place where Jesus had just finished praying, one of his disciples requested, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus told them, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, the equivalent of that scripture, and we are not going to read it, is found in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 9 to 13. Uh, both instances were different. In the one we have just read in uh, Luke chapter 11, the disciples had requested Jesus to teach them how to pray. And we, as, as we are going to be seeing as we go on, it's actually one disciple that had requested Jesus to teach them how to pray as John had taught his disciples. That was one context where Jesus taught them how to pray using this famously known as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the, the, the scenario in Matthew, or the next scenario, which we are not going to read, which is in Matthew chapter 6, this was uh, Jesus as he was going about his uh, normal business, and he was teaching his disciples many things, uh, for example, on how to give or how to do charity work, and he was telling us in what attitude they should be in as they were doing charity work, and, uh, you know, and uh, he, after that he was teaching them also how to pray, and he went on again and did the prayer or taught them the prayer that is in um, Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 which is more or less the same that uh, with the same that he taught in chapter in Luke chapter 11. So I would want us today to take time briefly and look at uh, a prayer a prayer as our way of communing with God. Prayer as a way of two people being able to communicate, two people that can talk to each other and listen to one another. Uh, prayer not as a way of just us talking and asking and making requests to God and uh, saying now we have gone, we have left our requests with God, we can go. But also positioning prayer as, not, as a way we can also be able to hear God speaking to us. Uh, hearing God is one of those things that is um, highly skipped when we come to uh, defining prayer as a way of communing with God. We are very good at praying and we can carry our prayer lists and take them to God and pray and pray and pray. And some of us are very good at praying for long hours, but really do we take time to listen to what God has to say to us. And a lot of times God will speak to us through his word. And that is why prayer, a, 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 a rich prayer life has to be coupled with a rich word life. Because when we pray, a lot of times, like for me, the highest percentage of time God speaks to me through his word. So I cannot just afford to pray and live out his word. Prayer and word, uh, prayer life and word life need to go together. So we need to uh, be able to look at prayer, not just as a way of us opening up to God, but also a way of us being able to hear what he has to say to us. Now, I want to note a few things about prayer. Maybe these are the ones that I'm just going to talk about today, but uh, it's okay. They will still be of benefit to us. But I want to teach, tease out or pull out a few things that we are seeing in these scriptures that we have read concerning prayer and especially in what Jesus was teaching his disciples. And uh, the first thing I want to note about prayer is that prayer ought to be the lifestyle of a believer. Or prayer ought to be the lifestyle of a child of God. In the same way we find that when we have friends that we value, friends that we love, family members that we want to keep in touch with, we don't just say they are, they are our friends and we don't look for them, we don't talk to them, we don't reach out to them, we don't hear what they may need to say to us. We want to reach out to our friends, we want to talk to them because that then becomes our lifestyle of friendship. Now in the same way with prayer, as a child of God, we need to make prayer our lifestyle. Prayer is not something we do on need basis. When we need something, when we are uh, uh, run out of something, when we have run out of resources, when we have run out of uh, 
uh, uh, livelihood, then we can run to prayer. It's not an emergency uh, rescue kind of thing. Prayer is a daily interaction between God and his children. And no wonder when the disciples requested Jesus to teach them how to pray, Jesus told them, when you pray. He did not tell them, if you pray, or in case you are going to pray. He told them, when. When means you are going to be praying anyway. So when you pray, and not if you pray, meaning it was expected for them to pray and make prayer a lifestyle. The example that Jesus set for himself, that he set himself to his disciples, was that of prayer. He lived a life of prayer, like we are going to be seeing as we, as we go down. So one of the things that we must note about prayer is that it must be the lifestyle of a child of God. Uh, the other thing that I want us to, to note about prayer is that Jesus himself set the example of prayer for us. Jesus set the example of prayer for us. Though he was God, we know that when he walked here on earth, he was both man and God. So he had what we experience as human beings, but also he had the God capacity in him. And though he was God, he still found it important to keep in constant communication with God, his Father, through prayer. Um, so Jesus prayed because he need, also needed to set an example for us that we must be uh, people of prayer. And remember, because Jesus was God, he did, by the way, he did not need to, have to pray anyway. He was God. He knew what he needed to do. He knew what he needed to do in situations in life. But he prayed. He took that time. He took his time to commune with the Father. Why? Because I believe one of the things that made him become a prayerful person, though he was God, is because he needed to set for us an example for prayer as his, uh, uh, as his followers. And I want to just show you a few scriptures, and I will not read them, I'll just mention them as I go down, where Jesus actually had to pray. One of them, and you can note them down in your notes because of time, one of the incidences that we find the Bible talking about Jesus praying, and there are many, by the way, there are very many in the New Testament, uh, and especially in the Gospels, where we find Jesus having taken time to pray. One is Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23. And uh, this, the, a similar uh, verse uh, to that is Mark chapter 6 verse 46. Both of them are giving an account of how Jesus had been with the crowds and he had fed them. This actually is after he fed the 5,000 people. And the Bible says that after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. So that is one instance we see Jesus uh, taking time to pray. And then we also see Luke chapter 6, verse 12. You can read that on your own. This is when Jesus went on the mountain to pray, and he prayed the whole night, the night before he went down to pick his 12 disciples. That was another time also that he took time to pray in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35 also tells us that early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went away to a secluded place where he was praying. And finally, and these are just very few examples of uh, the life, the prayer life of Jesus, is Luke chapter 5 and verse 16. And this one just shows us that Jesus was praying often because the, the verse says, the, the, the scripture says in Luke 5 and 16, but Jesus himself would often, and often means many times, usually, would often slip away to the wilderness to pray. So that shows us that Jesus had regular times of prayer. And I am sure part of the reason that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray is because they had seen that his lifestyle was always about a, a person that was uh, praying. So prayer is Jesus himself set an example for us of prayer as we have seen in the different scriptures. Then another thing I want to bring to our attention also about prayer is that prayer is not something many people are willing to do. Because prayer is work. 
prayer is not something that we find many people willing to do or willing to learn. And um, we even with the disciples of Jesus, and if you, even if you look through the, the life of Jesus Christ when he served here on earth, we really find us, people asking him to teach them how to pray. And even in the instance, this instance of Luke chapter 11, among the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, because I want to believe this question was asked by one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, I want to, you to see the ratio of how many were interested in finding out from Jesus how to pray. It was one, the Bible says, one disciple asked Jesus, told him, teach us how to pray. A ratio of one up to, uh, out of 12, I think is quite a, a, a small ratio. So it is not something that most people are willing to do or to learn. And we see that even with Jesus' team, one of them, just one, uh, in his entire time that he worked with them, was willing to ask him to tell them, to, t to teach them uh, how to pray, you know, like uh, John taught his disciples. And, and also remember, at one of Jesus' hardest time on earth, when he was going to face his death at crucifixion, he went to get Gethsemane with his disciples. And he expected, or his expectation would have been, because it was his hard and difficult time, that his disciples were going to stand with him in prayer, because these were his close uh, friends. And you, can, you will see in Luke chapter 22 and Matthew chapter 26, because those two uh, books give this account, that the disciples kept sleeping when Jesus was busy agonizing and praying and expecting that they would be standing with him. You know the way what, that time when you expect that your friend is really standing with you, when sometimes you're not even able to pray on your own and you are saying, oh God, I hope so-and-so is praying for me, so-and-so is praying with me. But here was Jesus with the disciples, the, his closest. And actually, he had, um, I guess he had walked with, them, walked with them to the mountain to pray with them because I think the way he had walked with them and explained himself to them, I think they must have understood how heavy the burden was upon him as he was nearing his crucifix crucifixion. But they slept. In fact, Matthew, the account on Matthew 26 says three times Jesus went to pray and came and found them sleeping. So prayer is not something <laughs> that we really uh, want to keep doing, but it is something that we must do because it is one way that God teaches us to depend on him, to trust in him, and to grow in him. Then another thing I want us to note also about prayer is that we do not pray to tell God what he does not know. When we are praying, we are not coming to introduce our problems and our struggles and our troubles to God because he is not aware. No, we do not pray to let God uh, know of something he doesn't know. No, we, we pray. Actually, Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 6, the same one I was mentioning, verse 8 says that the Father knows what you need even before you ask. So we do not pray really because the God is not aware of our issues, is not aware of our predicaments, is not aware of our pains. No, we pray because it is the expectation of a father who even when he knows that his child has a need, he will expect that that child will ask from him because that is how the relationship is made, is kept functional and is kept working. And then the other thing I want us to note, to note about prayer today is prayer has a how-to. Prayer has a format. Prayer has a way of doing it. And that's why this disciple asked or told Jesus, teach us how to pray. Meaning, when it comes to prayer, there's a way of doing it. There's a, a how-to when it comes to prayer. And in this same account, in Matthew chapter 6, the Bible says, Jesus told the disciples when he was teaching them, he said, this is how you ought to pray. In this kind of a manner, pray. In other words, he was telling them, you do not just pray. You do not just, uh, you know, say your things the way you want to say them. Prayer has a how-to. It has a format. And I believe that is 
a part of what the disciples were asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. And I, I believe or I think many times we dislike prayer or most people will not want to be uh, involved a lot in prayer because they do not have the understanding of the how to which is clearly clearly taught in the Bible, as we are going to see, because I just want us to look at just one part of the how-to that Jesus taught his disciples. So when Jesus be now begins to uh, take the disciples through the how-to of prayer, he teaches them the prayer that we commonly or of, uh, most of the times call the Lord's Prayer. And I believe we call it the Lord's Prayer because it was taught by the Lord. But indeed, the Lord was teaching this prayer to us. He was teaching, us, t teaching it to his disciples. So it is the Lord's Prayer, yes, because that is what those who uh, have written the Bible have titled it. At. But it was taught by our Lord to us. It is actually our model prayer. It is the outline of how we ought to pray. It is the sketch or the flip framework of how we ought to pray. So Jesus told them, the disciples, when you pray, say. The first thing he told them is to say. And the word say, interpreted in Greek, is lego or lego, whichever in the school you went to, lego or lego. The word say means uh, is, is in, the word to say in English is interpreted as lego, which is to say lay forth, which means to lay forth. Another word for that is relate. Another word is set a systematic discourse or discussion. Another word is ask, call, describe, give out, name, put forth. Tell or utter. All those words are supposed to explain the meaning of the word say. And Jesus told them, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. In other words, what Jesus was telling them is, when you pray, <laughs> don't just repeat these words after me. Don't repeat this prayer after me. But let the words of this prayer prepare for you, set a systematic discourse for you, and, and teach you or show you how to describe your needs before God the Father. Use this format to describe what you are putting forth before your Father, and that is what you call prayer in a systematic uh, manner. And he told them, say, our Father who art in heaven. In other words, and that is the first part of what I want us to look at is when we say our Father who art in heaven, we, what we are saying is that when we are coming into a time of prayer, we are coming into a relationship. We are coming into a relationship. Prayer is a time of relating to God. Prayer is a moment of a relationship with our Father. And that is why Jesus started the prayer with our Father. Did you know that God has got many titles? God is mighty King. God is mighty Redeemer. God is Savior. God is our provider. But Jesus did not start his prayer when he was teaching the disciples how to pray. He did not tell them to start with mighty and everlasting Father like we are used to starting. A great and awesome God, we come before you. King of kings and Lord of lords, we come before you. Uh, you know, and you know all the words that we can use when we want to describe uh, our, our words and our prayers to God. And sometimes we use mighty, mighty words, you know, to really want to, to draw the attention of God to ourselves. But Jesus told them, start with our Father. In other words, start from the place of a relationship and as you go on in your prayer even as you tell him let your will be done even as you ask him to provide for the needs of the day remember that this is your father that you are talking to that is the beginning point and i'm sure that is why jesus put that at the beginning of the prayer that when you are beginning going to pray remember that the person you are dealing with yes he is mighty yes he is awesome Yes, he is glorious. Yes, he is omnipotent. 
he is omnipresent, and he's all those great words that we like to use when we describe him. But when it comes to the point of relating, we, I want you to look at him as your father, because literally, when you are praying, you are in a relationship with God. And the one, relation, the one father I mean brings out to us a real uh, uh, state of a relationship. So prayer, friends, should come from a place of a relationship with a father and a son or a father and a child. And every time I think about this kind of a relationship, I want to look at my relationship between me and my father. Or I would want you to look at the relationship between you and your father. And, and I think there is more you do with your father than just ask, ask, and ask for things. In your relationship with your father, in my relationship with my father, there is more into our relationship than just asking, give me, give me, give me. Then when he has given me, I go and come back again when I am in need. I don't think that is how I relate with my father. And I don't think that is how you relate with your father. We, that, that is a, a more of, or less like a parasitic relationship. I only come to you when I need my needs to be met. After you have met my needs, see you, father, see you, my earthly father, until another day when I am in need of uh, when I am experiencing a need, God expects us to approach him from a point of a relationship and that of a father, son, or a father, child. And like I've said, Jesus could have given him, the, could have taught them to use the high and mighty titles of, of, of God, but he told them to start from uh, the, the praise of father. Another thing about the relationship that we should have with our father in prayer is that our relationship with our father should be a growing one. It should be a growing relationship. Actually, once again, when I think, um, I'm drawn to think about again my relationship with my own physical father. My relationship with my physical father has grown to an extent that these days I rarely ask him for anything. I don't go to tell him I need money, I need shoes, I need food. Because like Jesus would tell uh, people or his disciples when he, were, he was teaching them, your father knows that you are in need of those things. So I rarely find myself going to my biological father to tell him to give me, to give me this, to give me the other. I have found a greater security in my relationship with him that is based beyond the place of asking, that is be built on beyond the point of asking him for anything. We talk, yes, I call him, yes, but I am now realizing that the relationship between myself and my father is actually based on me taking my responsibility to build onto the relationship more than of me going to him to ask him for stuff that I need. And that is to mean my relationship with my father has developed, it has grown, it has matured. So I am now more expected to relate with my father in terms of a responsible person. Actually, my father would expect more responsibility of me than I would expect of him. And I think that is how we ought to see that kind of a relationship with the father, that we are growing every day within our relationship with our father as his children until it is not us who are expected to go and ask ask, ask, and he gives us, and we go celebrating, spend on uh, what we want to spend, and then when we come back again, we ask, because that is parasitic. That is not a good kind of a relationship. Our, I mean, the expectation on us with God as our father is that we must, we have matured, and now we are coming to him to, in, in, a, in a responsible uh, kind of ma manner, ma as mature sons who have learned to take responsibilities. And that's why I'm, I, 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 I want to say that I have seen and I've heard of fathers who have got such mature relationships that the sons are going ahead to do even greater things and surpass 
their fathers. And fathers are very proud of such sons who now have grown in responsibility, who have grown under the uh, guidance of their fathers until now they are doing things better than their fathers. And I'm not saying that in our relationship with God we should outdo him or outgrow him, but what I'm saying is every father looks forward to a time when their children have grown and matured and come to a responsible place where they can act maturely as those who are under their father. And no wonder Proverbs 23 and 24 says that the father of a righteous child, Proverbs 23 and 24, the father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. So God our father rejoices in seeing us maturing as his children. It gives him joy. So friends, what I want to say to us uh, this evening is, in prayer, we must not see God. We should not view God as a magician, as somebody who we go to because we have got needs and wants and problems, and, or an ATM machine. Because sometimes we treat God in our prayer life like he's either a magician or an ATM machine where we just go and press some keys, one, two, three, four, and some money comes out. Then we take the money, go and spend it on our, our pleasures or on our needs, and we go until the next time we come back because we are in need of money and the ATM will give us uh, money. I, and you know, there is no relationship that exists between us and the ATM except that one of giving us money. I doubt that you will go by the ATM and stand by and uh, greet it when you do not need anything from it. Because between you and an ATM, there is no relationship other than that of the ATM giving you money. So you rarely go, and especially when you know that there is no money in your bank, you don't go to the ATM and say, hi, ATM, I'm here, I'm passing by, I was just coming to make sure that our relationship is good. No, it doesn't happen like that. And sometimes <laughs> we, we treat God like that, like an ATM. Mungu to, to nipatie, nipatie, nipatie. Then God will give you and then say, bye God, until the next time I have a need. That is not a good kind of a relationship. That is being parasitic. So, or a magician. I give the example of an ATM and a magician. Magicians are also people who, uh, you know, when you go to them, they just uh, uh, say, say one, two, three, four. You know, they have those magic words they tell you to say, blah, 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 blah. And then you say them and then something happens and you get what you wanted and then off you are God until the next day when you want to, you know, depend on their activity. God is not like that. God desires that in our walk with him, we grow and mature in our relationship with him such that even when we come to him and we have a need and for his own reason, he does not provide for, to, he does not answer to that need or he does not provide for us, we will not run away from him. We will not go away saying God has disappointed us. We will still continue to be his children because we know that our relationship with him is not just based on what he gives us. It's not just based on him answering our needs. So what I want to conclude by saying is, yes, God is all powerful. God can choose to do all the things that we choose to do, even without, you know, necessarily engaging us in a relationship, but he knows that when he does that for us, we will not mature. God can choose to answer us miraculously and instantly, the way sometimes we want it. Because sometimes we want God to do blah, 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 quick, 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 one, two, three, get it, go away instantly, like a microwave. And sometimes God will not do that for us, although he can do it. He has power. To do it but he knows that a life of instant answers a life of miracles is not the best to sustain a relationship it does not mature us it does not grow us and therefore we shall be just like children who keep going to the father and we know children are very good at crying before their fathers and the and, and their parents they will go and cry and cry and cry because they want to pester something out of their parents and when they do that they know that when i cry before my father, he will give me what I want. And that is not the kind of relationship that God would want us to have with him. So for me, 
what I would want to, to uh, what I would want to encourage us and to remind us and to uh, uh, teach us today is for me as a person sorry I'm hitting on my microphone for me as a person between a miracle and an immediate gratification of a need that I may have between an immediate gratification of my need and a relationship I will choose a relationship between God, God answering my prayers miraculously and you know I live a life of miracle after miracle after miracle anything I want pap anything I want God provides for me pap between that kind of a life and a relationship personally I will go for a relationship because I know that as God continues to grow me as a son as his child I will continue to also get to know how does God do these things for me. And therefore, inside my relationship are hidden all the miracles. Inside my uh, relationship with God are hidden all the answers to my prayer. So, friends, what I want to say to us today is that we need to know God. We need to have God and we need to look at God as our Father, as a God who wants to relate to us and not just a God who wants to answer our lifestyle, uh, uh, our, our life's issues with answers one after another after another without us getting to a place of maturity. So it is in a relationship where growth and maturity is seen and is expected. It is in a relationship where growth and maturity is seen and is expected. And you know, like I've said, one characteristic of an, an immature child who has not, who is used to just being given, being given, 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 is crying so that their needs can be uh, met immediately. And that is what an immature child will do. And that is the understanding of an immature child when it comes to the father. That when I come to the, my father and I cry, I will be answered to. But what God wants us to do is to have, to have is a good and a growing and a mature relationship with him such that even when our answers are not forthcoming the way we would expect them, when our answers and our prayers are not being answered the way we would expect them to be answered, that we shall know that God still loves us. God still, because the, the attributes of a father, one of the attributes of our father is love. God still loves us as our father. God still wants to see us grow. God wants to, uh, 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 us to have the benefit of having that walk, growing and working relationship with him. So uh, as I conclude, that, uh, that is what I would want to say. So let us not exhibit, let us not exhibit uh, the, 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 the characteristics of a baby of a child. God expects us to realize that he is our father and fathers are careful to nurture their children, to want them to grow in faith the same way God who is our father and who Jesus has taught us to refer to as our father. When we pray to him, God would want us to mature and grow and have a growing relationship with him. So uh, may God help us. May God uh, continue to teach us and to minister to us even as we continue to see ourselves and find ourselves in those kinds and levels of relationship where we do not just want, want, want. We are not just asking, give me, give me, give me, but we want, we would also want to be in that place where God is saying, for this one, I may not give you, but I still love you. You are my child and I expect you to love me because I am your father. And that way, our relationship will grow. I, our relationships with God will grow like that of a maturing son and a father. May God bless you. May God uh, continue to minister to you. Amen. Let us pray. And we thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. Thank you for giving us an opportunity once again this evening uh, to go through your word and to uh, learn what you'd want us to learn today, especially concerning prayer. And that you are our God and our Father. And that that place of a son, that place of a father, is a place where you delight for us to know you and to grow in you. We pray that you'll teach us to know that even when we do not receive our answers as directly as we may want them, 
you still have the best for us because you love us and you care for us. Teach us to trust in you even when it may seem difficult. Teach us to hope in you even when we may not understand what is happening in our lives. But just to know that God who is our Father has good thoughts, has good plans, uh, and thinks well of us. Therefore, continue to lead us, continue to guide us and to minister to us and continue to uh, teach us more about your one and especially how you desire us to know that you are a loving Father and a caring Father to us. We give you praise, we give you glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 The Lord bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen.